more offices or not, uh, we are welcoming Gregory Ouillon, CTO EMEA at New Relic, who will tell us how to deploy fast, but with confidence. Hello, Gregory. Oh, can you hear me? Yes, we hear you. Can you try to share your screen? Yes, let me do this. Okay. Can you actually see my screen? We, we see your screen, we hear you, the stage is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, the purpose of my talk today, I'm Greg, I'm the field CTO for Europe, Middle East and Africa at New Relic. And I'll tell you what New Relic does in, in, in a second, is to discuss how we, we see observability being leveraged by uh, DevOps to move to modern architectures based on microservices, and, and how we leverage observability to deliver a higher velocity in how they innovate, but at the same time, deliver uh, high degrees and high levels of availability and performance. So New Relic in a nutshell, very fast, we are a leader in what we call observability as a service. So we are a SaaS provider. We are well established now, 12 years old, uh, and we help more than 16,000 customers to, to master the performance of their digital stack uh, from every industry to gaming, media and publishing, banking, industry, et cetera. Um, the way we do this is through our New Relic One platform, which really is helping uh, development teams and ops teams in multiple ways. The first one is the ability to ingest all the telemetry data they have on their digital stack in one place and to correlate all that data together to, so that you can have a unified view of your architecture. And then on top of that unified view, you can build dashboards, alerting, so that you can drive the performance of your stack. Uh, on top of this, we provide full stack observability, which means all the tools you need to troubleshoot, analyze your stack at the application level with APM, but also at the infrastructure level and middleware level. Uh, as well as the loads and the digital experience management. Um, because architectures are becoming way more complex these days, we also bring a layer of applied intelligence to augment humans so that they can detect issues very early, uh, correlate issues together and, and resolve them much faster, even in hugely complex uh, environments. And microservices tend to be those environments. So the imperatives for all of us are pretty clear. We want to go faster to innovate, to react to customer needs, to react to competition. We need to deliver superior user experience, whether for an API that uses experience is directly the consumer of that API, whether that is the end customer who is consuming services, consuming your APIs. And that relies obviously on a very strong mastery of availability, reliability, and performance. Uh, achieve that scale and make uh, mastering cost as well. So for all of this, to master this improved uptime performance and reliability, uh, the world has changed. We used to rely a lot on monitoring, and it was very fit for architectures where software was fairly static, released maybe a few times a year, deployed on a fairly stable static architecture, and we were scaling up uh, vertically. Uh, so we instrumented a few components of that architecture, very often infrastructure, and it was sufficient to tell you that something was happening when it was happening. Uh, nowadays, we have architectures which are composed of hundreds of microservices, sometimes thousands, API calls everywhere and all developed by multiple teams, which can end up that uh, an application behaves like an, a biological animal with uh, potentially thousands of releases per day uh, on that biological animal. And all this is deployed on much more volatile architectures, right? Containers, uh, cloud and stuff. So if you want to continue to understand how your stack behaves in that new environment, 
you cannot just sample a few uh, monitors in a few discrete places. You need to bring the, all your telemetry in one place and you need to instrument everything, the full stack. That's the only way that you can continue to understand how your system behaves and why, if there are issues, these issues are happening. Um, and as API providers, you are part of that ecosystem. So observability is a fairly straightforward set of technologies that allow you to instrument your stack from the lower levels of infrastructure, whether it's on-prem in the cloud, whether it's uh, virtual machines, containers, clusters. And on top of that, instrumenting the software itself, middleware components in cloud pass or in VM or container, and your actual software to understand what that software actually does. And then on top of this, adding the digital experience layer through real user monitoring from the mobile of a browser or installing the, or deploying synthetics for testing. Uh, more and more, we see observability also collect business metrics and business attributes and business events. This is to enrich the real-time visibility that you have and provide different facets to analyze the data of your stack. It would not be complete if you could not import third-party telemetry. Uh, you, re you depend for your APIs and microservices on other microservices. They might be instrumented in different ways, and you want to be able to get that data. Bringing all that telemetry in real time allows you to correlate it and build a real-time view of all the entities, how they depend on each other, and whether they are vertically dependent uh, on code and infrastructure, or horizontal dependencies uh, between microservices. Today, we consider that the linguo is metrics, events, logs, and traces to get the full understanding of how your systems behave. Once you have all that data there, uh, you can actually visualize it, understand your system, detect and resolve issues uh, extremely proactively, much faster, so that you can deliver uh, superior uptime, reliability, and performance, which are the keys for an API to deliver user experience and deliver on service level agreements. Um, such a platform like observability also allows you to innovate and cycle faster. Because once you have all the visibility on your stack uh, in production, you can also use the same processes and the same techniques to also understand the performance of your stack when you release. So you can get direct real-time feedback at the time of release. And obviously, it is also very useful when you transform your code and maybe you migrate from on-prem to a new architecture in the cloud you can baseline and compare the performance of your stack uh, before and after. What we see uh, these days is that um, in a DevOps and microservice economy, um, the, the way DevOps teams approach testing and validation is changing. Uh, a few years ago, there was the big shift left movement, which was all about testing early, automating testing in the dev cycle. What we see now is a bit of another trend, which is the shift right. Um, there's still a lot of load testing, smoke testing, non-regression being done in pre-prod. But the reality is more and more validation of releases is being done in production. And, and why is that? Because your microservice, your API, is part of a broader ecosystem to build an end-to-end -end service. And it's very difficult to get the real life conditions for your API and microservice <coughs> outside of production. Production is also the place where you get business and real experience feedback from your real traffic customers. So there is a big trend to actually validate performance in production. <coughs> That's why we have seen a flourishing of different release techniques, uh, obviously versioning for API, but also strategic deployment techniques like Canary, dark feature toggling, rolling, blue-green. It's all about 
being able to collect information on progressive deployments of new versions. So in an environment where you want to deploy faster, you want to somehow validate the, your releases in pre-prod, but also in production, uh, what do you need to do in terms of observability? Well, first you need to start small, you need to instrument your stack and you start to measure and you start to establish your first service level indicators, uh, metrics, and your first service level objectives. So it's really about starting to measure. Then you are going to build a muscle in your teams, which is about looking at those dashboards that describe the performance of your system uh, at each and every release, at each and every change, and start to really appropriate for the teams how they read the performance of their system through these dashboards. From there, obviously, you will move into continuous improvement. So what do you usually um, start with? Um, most uh, observability starts at the transaction level or the API level with golden signals. Latency, throughput, errors, saturation. So latency, throughput, and errors, I think, are fairly straightforward. Saturation is a bit of a variable concept. Saturation is measuring the component in your architecture, which is the bottleneck, the most fragile, the one that will break first. It could be CPU, RAM, it could be IO, it could be anything. So saturation will likely be defined by the teams once they start to deploy. Updex is a synthetic uh, metric that describes the frustration, satisfaction of a user or a consumer based on the target response time and performance level. So it's a normalized uh, KPI, which is very convenient to harmonize across multiple APIs and also to um, simply represent an SLA for, for an API. So this is the foundation, golden signals. And from this foundation, it's very important to establish a baseline. Um, oftentimes, what we see is that teams who start to look at the performance of their stack discover progressively what normal means. What is the normal behavior of our stack? And it doesn't mean it's the right level for your customers, but at least it's the normal level. And from there, you can start to have the discussions uh, with your stakeholders, customers, internal stakeholder teams about what their SLOs or SLAs should be. And maybe they are way above what your normal is, which means you have technical debt to solve and work to do. Or maybe you're actually overperforming and maybe you could optimize your resources and get deliver a much better unit cost. So understanding where you stand baselining and then setting SLOs is a key step. Then as you start to release often, you start to better understand your architecture and the teams get used to observability, you will probably expand the number of metrics you're looking at, but it's very dangerous to have too many metrics because people get lost. It's usually very powerful if all the teams can share a very well-defined set of KPIs and metrics that best describe holistically the behavior of your microservice or API. So that everybody can align to a one understanding of the stack. Uh, because it depends on your business, on your industry, there is no real truth there, but you will feed more and more KPIs, including business, including demographics, so that you can understand how you serve the various segments of your business differently, and you can therefore uh, derive meaningful insights. And obviously you will go into continuous improvement, uh, which is the world of SREs, right? Site reliability engineers. Will it be that you want to improve your mean time to repair and mean time to detect? Uh, you got some technical debt to improve your SLAs because you still have too many outages. Um, is your deployment rate and change rate failure too high? 
Um, basically, there you will go into your cycle. But having the long-term view of the performance across your full stack allows you to understand that technical debt and understand how it propagates to your stakeholders and customers. Another key feature we see, obviously, in those microservice uh, architectures and API-driven economies is that your API is being consumed by an application provider. So they would love to have visibility on your component. If your microservice is consumed internally to a company, that company will choose to use an observability platform to understand the end-to-end -end view, and they will enable distributed tracing to understand how your microservice and API contributes to the end-to-end -end performance of the customer or consumer transactions. But if you provide the same service to a third-party customer, then I would still argue that there is value in enabling distributed tracing and publishing uh, through open tracing standards the tracing information to your customers and stakeholders. I believe that in the coming years, the ability to provide visibility and transparency will be a differentiator for API economy providers. You would love that from your own providers downstream. So if you can provide it to your upstream customers, we will do all the better job. Uh, another thing is that uh, obviously, as I mentioned, we do more and more testing of our APIs through real customer production traffic, but it is not always practical and you would like to be able to replace some of that traffic with synthetic traffic. So synthetics are now very sophisticated to simulate transactions that call your APIs from all over the world or behind your firewall uh, so that you can get a view on that synthetic traffic of your availability, reliability, and performance. And sometimes it can be very useful, for instance, to do some preload or pre-testing uh, in staging, but also in prod on the blue-green. Uh, it could be also very useful if you have a low volume API, but super mission critical. Using synthetic traffic will feed in the gaps between your low intensity calls, but super critical and allow you to deliver quality. So observability should be part of any DevOps team. I think I'm preaching to the core here. And it needs to be automated. Um, observability is not the realm of ops, as it was probably with monitoring. Uh, observability is a muscle that's part of the CI CD pipeline. And teams who develop APIs today should think that instrumentation of their code should be part of their builds and deployments. It should be automated. So that as soon as a code enters into production on its target environment, it will start to report so that the uh, SREs and DevOps teams can obviously monitor it in production, but also validate any new release against performance criteria, whether it's response time, throughput, uh, error rate, and error budget, or maybe business KPIs. So it will support your release management cycle and your, the ability to make very fast decisions in terms of rollback, confirming production, or fix forward. So I'd like to thank you very much. I mean, this was just a, a hint at what observability can do for uh, your API and microservices. Uh, if you'd like to reach us for a demo, obviously, neuralic.com or we have a free tier. Uh, so if you want to learn, if you want to try, just uh, reach our free tier and get going. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Gregory. And uh, we are on time. We have even three minutes to take some questions. If there are, um, I'm just checking the questions. Uh, it was about monolith. Um, what? Uh, what is the main advice you can give to people to deploy fast with confidence? What is the main thing, the one thing they should never 
set aside? Well, never set aside, I think, is really about um, first deploying small chunks, right? We all know this. I think microservice is the spirit of this. So you understand, you reduce the blast radius of your regressions, if any, and then build that muscle of, of measurement. Because what I've seen in so many teams is that when you start to have that data-driven factual view of what's going on, collaboration goes much faster. There's much less blame or finger pointing because people get to align to one full view, full stack of what's going on. So attribution of issues goes much faster. Attribution of detection of issues like performance regression, that trends also happen very fast. So I think that building that muscle of really seeing more and more often smaller chunks and measuring constantly is really the recipe for everybody being happier, getting better equipped, and moving much faster. Yeah, so small change, measure, and cycle. For yeah, absolutely. Okay. Thank you very much, Gregory. And now we will welcome Robert Wonderlich, 